Welcome to the new number of the journal. 50 years of the law on official languages. We'll listen to about 10 authors that participated in this journal. I'm Jason Lukerhoff. I'm the director of the journal, and I thank the partners. This launch is held in collaboration with the Quebec English Speaking Communities Research Network, Questcren, at Concordia University in Montreal, and the International Observatory of Language Rights at the Université de Moncton. I invite the Commissioner of Official Languages of Canada, Mr. Raymond Teberge, for the opening address. Mr. Teberge. Thank you very much. Well, hello to everyone. It's with pleasure that I'm joining you today to underline uh, the 17th number of the journal, uh, Lingu um, Minorities in Languages and Society. I'd like to congratulate those that organized this meeting, the directors of the journal, and all the authors that contributed articles. Research uh, collaborating uh, like this is crucial to help us to understand our two uh, languages, its past and uh, the challenges it's facing today and to have strategies for the future. A lot of things have changed since the 50th anniversary of the law on official languages that I underline in the journal. In these pandemic times, we live uh, a lot of national challenges and um, political problems throughout the earth. Um, talks about identity and languages in contemporary debates. In recent years, the language situation in Canada has generated a great deal of excitement as much on a federal level as on provincial and territorial one. Francophone immigration, education in official language minority communities, and the modernization of various provincial legislation, as well as the announcement regarding the reform of the act by the federal government have brought language issues to the forefront. In order to know where we go from here, it's good to know where we came from. So I, want, I wanted to begin by speaking about the evolution of language rights in Canada and the Official Languages Act, and then about the challenges the Office of the Commissioner of Official Language is facing today in terms of modernization. Canada is a country with two official languages, but as a Franco-Manitoban and a, from a small French community, I can confirm that the Canadian uh, language identity is not the same from one ocean to the other. I was able to see and live through uh, many manifestations of this throughout my life that took me from the prairies to Ontario, going through Quebec and New Brunswick. The duality of languages in Canada changes with geography, but also uh, with time. This is an experience that changes in time and space. We can think that this makes appreciating uh, being bilingual very uh, small for the 38 million Canadians that live in the second largest country of the world. Well, let me reassure you. The Office of the Commissioner recently conducted a Canada-wide survey on support for official languages. The result, 87% of Canadians support the Official Languages Act. Another very interesting finding from the survey is the positive relationship between our official languages and diversity. A large majority of Canadians agree that official languages and other forms of diversity work well together and can make each other stronger. The survey also shows strong support for language, second language education programs and programs to support official language minority communities. More than ever, Canadians want their children to reap the benefits of bilingualism. And I believe that no matter where they live, every child in Canada should have the opportunity to become bilingual. At a time when many societies are turning inward, I find this openness very encouraging. And speaking of openness, I am proud to say that I am no longer the only commissioner of official languages at the federal level. Speaking to you from Treaty One territory, the traditional territory of the Ashinabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Metis Nation, I would like to say hello to my colleague, Ronald E. Ignace, the new commissioner of Indigenous languages and his team. 
history between French and English and the more than 70 spoken indigenous languages have been marked by difficulties, tragedies and injustices. Indigenous languages need to be valorized and protected uh, within reconciliation. Thankfully, as our research has shown, most Canadians are today of the opinion that Canada can and must promote both Indigenous languages and the official languages. I see a complementarity between uh, promoting these official languages and first languages. Canada is always evolving. When talk, thinking about uh, Canadian identity, when we talk about diversity and official languages and reconciliation, Indigenous languages are part of this reflection. It's the proof that we are not a country that's stuck in time. I talk about the future, but I also look first at the past. The law on official languages is the fruit of social and political movement of the 1960s, a tumultuous time uh, with a lot of fights for uh, equality of sexes, decriminalization of contraception and homosexuality, and also indigenous people. This led to a lot of social changes. The fight of Francophones to be able to exist and to be recognized as equals was also in the same uh, line of thought, which led to adopting the law of on official the languages in 1969. The Act recognizes the equal status of English and French in federal institutions and allows Canadians to access federal services in both languages. It also made it possible to create the Office of the Commissioner of Official Languages of Canada, which I've had the privilege of heading for the past four years. The Act has set the tone for the reality and legality of linguistic duality issues across Canada. It has guided the fight for official languages in the federal, provincial, and territorial spheres across the country for half a century and has itself been enhanced by these citizen-focused efforts. I think about the adopt, adopting the policy on, on uh, services in French in Manitoba in 1960. It, at the end of the years 19, 1990s to close the hospital, in 1994 and also in 2017, the fight of uh, English-speaking communities to uh, maintain their school boards. Also for um, federal agents to be able to speak in the language of their choice. And also the recent victory in the FFCB affair. Also other fights are being done throughout the, the country. Certain collaboration is needed between the different levels of the government. It seems reasonable to me to conclude that more than ever, Canadians are aware of their language rights, attuned to their challenges, and sincere in their desire to proudly assert themselves within their communities in a changing world. Though the, through these events, it is clear that Canada's linguistic duality is a very contemporary and fundamentally inclusive value that is not only enshrined in the act, but also in people's identity. As imperfect as the act may be, it has set new standards and expectations, and it has fostered renewed awareness. The history of language rights does not begin with the Official Languages Act. One thinks, among other things, of Baldwin Lafontaine, of French language education when Alberta and Saskatchewan joined Confederation, of the New Brunswick Official Languages Act, along with that of the federal government. These are examples that urge us to consider the act as an organic and living entity, rather than as an inanimate object or a brutal set fact. The act is most effective when it serves as an inspiration or a tool for democratic revitalization against the dangers of complacency and indifference. It helps guide collective action and protect rich community identities, making us all stronger in the process. 50 years after the act was first drafted, the world has undeniably and greatly changed. What we need is a modernized, current, dynamic, and robust act and regulations. 
The project of the law of Bill C-13 to reform official languages has been recently presented at Parliament. This one uh, wants more rights for the Commissioner of Official Languages, like sanctions to be able to protect our official languages and uh, those that speak these languages. The government recognized that it's time to evolve. I want to reassure you that the com commissioner will uh, show a lot of, to show wisdom that our, our official languages will be able to face today's challenges and those of tomorrow. In Canada, language and multiculturalism policies were designed to coexist. The complementarity of these policies leads to mutual empowerment. I fundamentally believe that our languages enrich the regions in which they are spoken and that in practical terms, they offer new social, cultural, and economic opportunities. The official languages are uh, an inheritance of our past, but are turned towards the future with an, a, a political and social project that's inclusive, that brings together these are the values that guide my actions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Teberge, from the Commissioner of Official Languages of Canada, who will stay with us and, and participate in the panel, and you'll be able to ask questions at the end. Those that are here at the uh, conference, don't hesitate to send messages on the chat. This number of the journal is av available at this journal on Irudzi for free. And this was under the direction of Eric Faure, Patrick Donovan, Lorraine O'Donnell, and here's Lorraine O'Donnell. Hello, bonjour. Greetings from the unceded lands of Montreal. The Ghanaian Gahaga Nation is recognized as custodian of these lands. Uh, we at Questcran at Concordia University in Montreal were very, very pleased to collaborate once again with CIRLM as well as with the Observatoire International des Droits Linguistiques on the conference, which was a lot of fun. Back pre-COVID, it was live and in person. And uh, then on getting together the proceedings that, that in other words, the, the uh, pulling together articles for this, conf for this journal issue, which represents the contents of the uh, conference. Uh, Quebec, province is um, an extremely complex linguistic landscape. We have the Official Languages Act interacting, um, sometimes contradicting, so there's a lot to discuss and address with Bill 101, now Bill uh, 96, which is on the table, and of course the Indigenous Languages Act passed in 2019. And I'm just thrilled that this journal pulls together such a broad range of perspectives that the world of Quebec um, language politics and social discussions around those are being put not just in a provincial perspective, but also the Canadian national and the international perspective. So I hope um, you will join all of us in listening with enthusiasm to the presentations today and in reading the articles available on the RUD platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorraine. So two other uh, co-editors of this uh, special issue, Eric Farg and Eric Labelle Estaf. So we're very happy to present this uh, number of the journal, which uh, is taking advantage of the 50th uh, anniversary of the law of official languages to reflect on the uh, situation of official languages after 50 years of experience with the law that we know. The number is uh, a collaboration uh, between the ACFAS in uh, 2019 with Question and the Observatory and the Institute. Because there was already uh, an important reflection that had started on modernizing the law, we thought that the moment was opportune to uh, do a collaboration on this. And because of the historical context, we thought that it would be important to uh, make place on this reflection and points of view of uh, those that are living in the situation uh, when it has to do with official languages and not just from universities. So we were happy to underline the 
uh, contributions of these organizations. Of course, this number also has articles that are academical, so it will give us, uh, will give uh, um, an idea of this today. Thank you very much. We're going to continue now with the first question that we're going to ask to each member of the panelists of the panel um, one at a time. Mr. Tebelge for the first question. If we can make him visible in the center, please. The question for you, Mr. Tebelge, is how can we learn from the past to uh, make the future? Well, I think that the answer to this question can be uh, resumed to a few points. First of all, we need to remember that there was a, a particular situation 50 years ago in order to make in place and put in place this law in official languages. What the past shows us is that we also need to be vigilant because even if the law was adopted in 1969, we put it in place uh, over a period of over 50 years and we can see, uh, I, I saw around 2018, there was a certain complacency in putting this law in place and it was time to modernize this law. And this law needs to take into account the new realities of today and of tomorrow. So the law as it exists answers or answered uh, certain needs, but in the future, uh, it needs to also answer not just these past needs, but also um, a different uh, reality. We talked before about diversity, we talked about reconciliation, we talked about Indigenous languages, and etc. And of course, uh, technology as well. But what was important is to remember that we all need, always need to be vigilant when putting into place a law. We can have the best law possible ever, but as many in the, on the panel said, the problem is putting it into place. And we see today that we have challenges when it comes to putting in, uh, this law in place as it exists. Even if we have a law that's stronger, more robust, we always need to be vigilant in putting it in place. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Martin Serix, what is the effect on the law on uh, French uh, in Quebec? Thank you very much. In my article, I propose that Canada chose the duality of languages as a, a model to Im imagine uh, the Canadian identity. English Canadians or Anglo Canadians imagine themselves as sharing a common national identity with obvious differences and particularities. But the sense of affiliation is imagined and reinforced in some way in the minds of all Anglo Canadians, or at least most. On the other hand, and for reasons that we all know very well, a, a, a Franco Canadian identity needs to be imagined or reimagined because it existed before 1967, or at least it existed as much among French speaking Canadians as among English speaking. The spirit manifest in the Official Languages Act is not just one of a political compromise, but of a compromise between two imagined national communities that, at least symbolically, are meant to be seen as having equality of status. Bill C-13 in every way reinforces this view that Canada is a binary state, at least at the linguistic level. And language in Canada arguably, arguably continues to be one of the main foundations upon which cultural identity is constructed and imagined. This, I extrapolate, is why StatsCan labels English and French as languages of convergence. This is a choice of words that uh, says a lot, but where the government, a federal government, talks of these two linguistic identities that converge in Canada, will French Canadians be as ready to do this? Will the ideology of the linguistic duality um, make uh, this identity come together. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the next question is for Robert Talbot. 
changes to the political landscape have revived the debate over linguistic duality. Uh, according to you, uh, many of the arguments being made in, 19, in 2019 were not unlike of those of uh, 1969 or even 1929. What are the lessons from 1929, 1969, and beyond? Thank you. Uh, well, I'll try to be brief uh, and and I'll allow uh, a little uh, bit of uh, being honest. I think um, one of the lessons of history is that uh, there are a lot of arguments um, against official languages, but these are these are not new. There was an article that uh, made waves over the weekend that was published by the Toronto Sun that some might have read. Um, but a lot of the things that were said in that article, we've heard them before, um, and we've, they're, they've been around at least for 100 years. But un unfortunately, they're often framed, things are often framed as a zero sum, that official languages and diversity are at odds with each other, uh, rather than, than being mutually reinforcing, like the, the commissioner said. Uh, and unfortunately, we see these, this argument is sometimes put forward um, as an argument of convenience, rather than uh, comparing minorities or the rights of minorities to, to greater rights, the, the intent is sometimes to diminish those rights that do exist. I think another lesson from history is that these sometimes negative voices take up way more oxygen than perhaps they're due. Um, uh, you know, we, we must not ignore these, but we must also be careful about amplifying and then also conversely belittling uh, the, the voices of those who do support official languages. And on that point, I think allies matter. A history shows that we need people from the within the majority communities speaking out in favor of minority uh, official language rights and more generally moderates i think have a duty a responsibility uh, to speak up especially in this day and age when uh, some of the angrier voices tend to be the louder or, or more represented and on that point just to, to finish um when we do speak to the majority we need to make sure that we're speaking uh in terms that are relevant and that resonates and that i i, I sum, sum i sum these up at the end of, of the article and i think one of the most important ones is to talk about this complementarity between uh, official languages and canada's broader diversity uh, and fortunately uh, as the survey data show as the commissioner pointed out uh, there is a majority support for these these concepts. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question is for Monsieur Rodrigue Landry. What are the conditions that are necessary for a law and the policies for languages have a, a real effect on uh, the laws of minor uh, the lives of minorities? This is a concept of uh, cultural uh, independence. Three actors are essential to. Uh, assure the vitality of a minority. One is the in, uh, intimacy community, such as families, that has the role of uh, transmitting between generations language and identity, without which the language will stop existing. The second actor is the civil, uh, like uh, the community leaders that have a leadership that contributes to the institutional needs that the group needs to keep uh, the language alive and pertinent. Uh, the state is the third actor that uh, acts on the vitality of a language that uh, offers to the group uh, individual and collective rights and services in the language that assures that this language is legitimate. Research that was analyzed in my article, I show two principles that every uh, ling language law needs to uh, respect if it wants to uh, respect the vitality of a minority. This can be uh, resumed as the needs to um, coordinate on a so societal language, um, societal uh, level. This law on official languages had effects that are mostly limited to the vitality of languages because it hasn't been applied uh, more than just on the for federal level. So this had not many effects on the identity of uh, members of minorities. 
the government, federal government has um, committed itself to favorize um, indigenous languages and development throughout Canada. Federal part of part of the government needs to uh, support this part seven of the law to assure a, a linguistic plan that's applied um, according to research. After 50 years, the law on official languages is undeniably an unfinished piece of work. Thank you very much, Mr. Landry. We'll now go to Mr. Westrom. It is assumed, Mr. Wistrom, that language policy can influence the language in which parents choose to raise their children. How is it possible to assign different policies to different minorities in a cost-effective manner? Well, <clears throat> to start with, it's necessary to use a cost-effective manner since you have a limited budget and you want the budget to work as well as you can, as it can. On the other hand, we need uh, information. We need more uh, empirical research on what affects people's language use, what makes pa parents send their children to a school in a certain language, in the mother tongue especially. And uh, that information is very often not available and we need it, so that's a, a um, a, um, or something the social linguists will have to do, and that's very important. And uh, one might have to work with trial and error, but in some cases it's pretty easy, if it, maybe, if you look at some uh, indigenous languages and uh, the, the, uh, they, they, need, uh, uh, they need support just to be normalized, that's a normalization, that's the, construction or writing of grammars and the vocabularies are very important. And in other languages that are well registered and well recorded, you might need schools. But again, this all depends on the cost. If the language is small and concentrated, well then schools can be very effective if the language is spread out over a big territory, then schools might not work very well or will become too expensive. You'll use a whole budget on schools. So, but in, um, at the end, what's necessary is more empirical research to find out how people react, how parents react to various policy measures and how that changes over time. And once you have that, you can cons consider how to divide up the budget in the most effective manner. Thank you. I hope you could hear me because the connection here is very bad. Well, it, it did cut off uh, a couple of times, but we got, uh, we could hear you uh, even though uh, it, it did cut several times. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next person I'd like to uh, ask a question to is um, Mr. Eric Farg. What do we need to remember on the context that influence the efficiency of a linguistic law. Thank you. So when we consulted uh, around revising this uh, official language law, we know this is important after 50 years of adopting this law. So this is not new. This has to do with uh, linguistic laws, not just on the federal level, but within provinces. So my text is uh, uh, has to do with the questioning that I had. What explains the challenges that we face in putting in place and respecting these linguistic laws? I saw that there wasn't much research done on the question, which helps us to understand the challenges of putting in place and respecting the laws of official languages in Canada. We can think that the, it, the explanation has to do with the strength of the law and the jurisprudence. The solution would go uh, by reinforcing this law. Laws or more uh, generally uh, linguistic 
uh, rights has a role in this, but there's also factors that have less to do with the right, but also on the social and organizational context. So to understand these contexts on what a sociologist called the efficiency of uh, the linguistic laws, I propose in my text uh, an analysis uh, that can be done on this problem. So first I show that uh, the efficiency of uh, the law, then I show the large dimensions, social, political, cultural, and economical, and also the organizational uh, that can, uh, sides that can affect uh, the efficiency of this language law. So let's take an example, a simple example, uh, offering services in both official languages. So until what point those that have to offer th these services understand the concept of uh, offering services, know how to do it, are predisposed to do it, have the resources to do it. For a person to offer these services, this supposes that the direction has leadership and putting into places like hiring bilingual employees, training in language their employees, evaluating their linguistic uh, capabilities, showing um, uh, putting in place resources for translating. Uh, the, so we need to take into account the complexity of the efficiency of, of the uh, linguistic context. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fogg. Now, Mr. Eric Labelle-Estoff, what are the interpretations that are possible of the Article 41 uh, built, Article 41, and what are the best ways to reinforce uh, the framework of this? Thank you very much. There are two uh, large interpretations that are different of Article 41 that are facing off uh, for a few years. On one side, there's interpretation that's been privileged by the federal government that is very restrictive and that was that took all sense out of Article 41. According to the federal government, Article 41 and Part 7 uh, puts a, a discretion, discretionary power to the government. It's up to them to decide how and uh, why and when he will do that. Uh, they will do this and what uh, are the extent of the measures that they will put in place. So if we're not satisfied by what the, the federal institutions do, there's nothing that we can do. Um, the courts have nothing that can be done uh, when it comes to the decisions of the federal government. On the other side, there's the position that was defended by the Commissioner of Official Languages, CFA, the Federation of French Speakers of uh, British Columbia, that uh, says that Article 41 imposes obligations that are very precise to the federal government. The government has the obligation, first of all, to not um, get in the way of uh, developing language, uh, language communities in minority languages. So it means that they need to pay, take in information on the needs and interests that when they put in place programs and policies uh, that what they're about to do will not only uh, not uh, go against their interests but also will contribute to it of course in this there's a obligation to consult that comes from article 41 so i'm thankful to say in uh, january the federal uh, government uh, came across uh, with me to agree that the second interpretation is the right one. Now we'll go to the Federation of French and Acadian uh, Communities. What was your proposal of a, of a law to modernize the law that you made public in March 2019? Thank you very much for inviting us to this uh, nice launch. Our, our article spoke about uh, this model law project that CFA and its whole network. We represent 21 members that are members of our federation, 21 organizations within our federation. So we prioritized elements and we put in place um, a model uh, law to 
so that communities don't necessarily have to wait for the government to do all the work. I think it's important for communities to mobilize and to put into lang legal language uh, all of their uh, needs. So for us, uh, a law text is very complex, so we wanted to be precise in our approach, but also to fix the problems that exist since uh, the first law, so which is putting in place this law. So the law since the last 50 years have certain principles that are pretty clear, but putting uh, this law into place while consulting and uh, with communities, that's where it's always been a problem. So since that time, there's been a first project of C32 in June 2020, and then C13 that was proposed this winter. So our requests now today uh, are concentrated on amendments. So we're co concentrating on elements that are maybe more structural, that are uh, still absent or partially present in the project of law. So uh, the governance that would be in charge of coordinating putting in place the law, this has always been the problem. So we would like a central agency to coordinate putting in place this law and that there would be mechanisms uh, that are a lot more clear. Second, we want to reinforce part seven, an obligation to consult communities when we put in place and develop these uh, positive measures. Uh, linguistic clauses when the federal uh, gives money to the provinces and territory, a policy in immigration, French immigration that's uh, repairing, that will reestablish the uh, demographic of our communities like how it was in the past, in the beginning of the years two, 2000. And lastly, powers to uh, oversee uh, we proposed before a uh, court. Now the government went more towards uh, reinforcing the toolbox of the Commissioner of Official Languages, but there's still a few elements missing, missing like sanction powers that could go further. But of course, the power could apply to part seven of the law. Right now, the new, this only applies to part four and five of the law. So there's some reinforcing that needs to be done. So that's what CFA is working uh, in this file that's evolving. It's already been about four years that we put in place this uh, project of model, uh, this model project. Uh, so we see the light at the end of the tunnel and we're getting there and it'll be a uh, pleasure to read uh, this uh, edition of the journal. Thank you, Monsieur Dupuy. Before uh, getting questions from those that are assisting this webinar, we have a last question I'd like to ask. Madame Rita Legault from QCGN that represent the Anglophones of The Quebec. Official Languages Act and the structures that are designed to support it do not reflect an equality-based approach. What are the causes of this inequality and what are the consequences for the vitality of the English-speaking community in Quebec? Rita. Hi. Bonjour. Hi. Uh, sorry, I'm a last minute stand-in for Sylvia martin Lafourche, who is actually in a meeting with stakeholders talking about Bill 96, which is the language legislation that's being passed here in Quebec, which uh, is going to have a huge impact on the English speaking community of Quebec here. So um, since the 50th anniversary of the Official Languages Act, um, language issues have certainly come to the forefront with uh, Bill C-32, which is now Bill C-13 following the election and Bill 96. Um, in the paper that um, Sylvia presented at the ACTAS conference, um, she basically explained that the English speaking community of Quebec, which is Canada's English linguistic minority community, has not received generous treatment in the implementation of the Official Languages Act. Sylvia's paper, which was based on her presentation at the 87th annual ACTAS conference, offered some ideas about why this situation has developed and discuss the impact this has had on the vitality of Quebec's English speaking community. She concluded that equality for both official language minority communities, the outcome that was envisioned in the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism must ultimately be achieved through the modernization of the Official Languages Act. 
Um, QCGN has always insisted that the central guiding principle of the act must be the equality of status of English and French. But we have also been insistent on ensuring that substantive equality is enshrined in the act to respond to the different needs of different linguistic minorities. QCGN believes the act, as well as the regulations, guidelines, policies, and programs that emanate from it, must not favor one language or one official language minority community over the other. As Canada moves forward on the all important modernization of the Official Languages Act, it is critical that the vitality of both national official language minority communities be equally and equitably considered. So, based on our reading of Bill C 13, um, uh, the Act to Amend the Official Languages Act, Canada's lang largest official language minority community, that is the English-speaking community of Quebec, will once again be left lagging behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for your answers to these questions. I have one now for all of you. We could put all the panelists, um, members of the panel, their videos side by side. To answer the question, uh, you can go freely. It can be exchanges as well. There can be discussions between you. What do you think on the project of law that was presented? So what do you think of that uh, law that was that, that project that was presented on the first of March two thousand twenty-two? I can uh, start. Firstly, I think that the pro law project uh, of Bill C thirteen is an improvement on the existing law. For example. <clears throat> mechanisms to conform or the powers of the commission commissioner also uh, part seven as as long as we'll uh, hold in place the interpretation of the federal court uh, i think that it's certainly uh, an improvement and this uh, makes a connection like what Mr. Landry was saying is part seven is the part that touches communities. So the need to consult communities, um, also the question of immigration, these are important elements that we find in uh, this law project. There are certain parts of the law that are not that are not the object of a lot of improvements part four when we talk about services and communication languages part five work languages there's certainly some challenges there also we take out uh, the exemption of uh, bilingualism in the Supreme Court. This doesn't change the law of nominating judges at the support Supreme Court, but it makes this more uh, easy. Us will concentrate uh, on parliamentary work to try and put modifications or improvements, for example, at the level of uh, governing or immigration and uh, uh, work languages and service languages. So this is an improvement. C-13 is better than C-32, but I think that uh, those that intervene have uh, a lot of work to do in the parliamentary works to put more improvements because we know that once a law is adopted, uh, making changes afterwards can be very long and difficult. And there's also an important element in the law, which is uh, revising this every 10 years. So this is very positive. Thank you very much, Mr. Tebelge, Mr. Fogg. Yes, uh, maybe quickly, but it, it's uh, connected to what was being said by the commissioner and uh, Alain Dupuis from CFA. There's some improvements that are done. And if I come back with the theme of my article, which is the efficiency of uh, linguistic laws, a, problematic that, a, a problem that has been shown while consulting uh, while, when doing the re revising of this law, there's some elements, uh, maybe not what we wish, but will help uh, make uh, the law more official, um, more efficient on the side of the Commissioner of Official Languages. Part seven, we 
uh, specify with more concrete measures. So we hope that there will be uh, ways to make this more concrete, part seven. We also strengthen the heritage, Canadian heritage. We also strengthen the role of the Council of Treasure that needs to put in an action plan while consulting communities that need to respect part seven. So in my opinion, there's some uh, steps done in the right direction. Thank you very much, Mr. Fogg. There's also Madame Legault that would like to intervene. Oops, you're muted though. My apologies. No problem. So, the QCPM believes the new legislation contains some positive steps forward. However, we remain concerned about the new direction the Government of Canada is taking um, with its support of French and French in Quebec and the long-term effects this change will have on the application of the Official Languages Act and the language rights of English speaking Quebecers. We are particularly worried about the creation of a new language of work and services rights for French in federally regulated businesses in Quebec. So um, the language of, uh, you, you have the right to French um, service and then to work in French, but not the right to work and receive services in English, which is um, a, a, a basics in the official language of that. There's strong language in the act that recognizes the importance of Canada's English and French linguistic minorities. And we fully support the government's obligations to support these communities in a way that recognizes each of their unique needs and challenges. But it's clear that it contains fundamental flaws, particularly in light of the government's um, proposed amendments to the Charter of the French Language, uh, Bill 96. Thank you. I'll maybe add, if I can, uh, for French communities, I mentioned it at the beginning, we feel like there's an improvement in the law in terms of uh, the govern, uh, governing of the law, but I'd like to also say we mentioned there's a role of coordinating in two areas, um, Canadian heritage that will need to coordinate a strategy and action plan, and a role of coordinating, uh, putting this into work, uh, certain parts of the law which is like part seven that was given to the Treasury Council. So this, uh, in our opinion, will make some confusion. There's two institutions that are in charge of coordinating. We um, say that there's a role to Heritage Canada, but we don't give them more tools to do this work. So it's a ministry uh, with files like others. So it won't be able to say to a ministry that doesn't want to uh, participate in this action plan to do so. So we want this role of coordinating uh, goes back to the Treasure Council. It can uh, join with uh, Heritage Canada or other areas, but that the role essentially be very clear. And right now, uh, Heritage will do the best that it can, and the Council of the Treasure as well will be able to put uh, directives on how to do it, but won't have the obligation to ask for corrections to be done if there's institutions that don't participate in it. So for us, it's problematic in certain files like immigration, where things haven't uh, moved enough in the last 15, 20 years, but also in the file of linguistic clauses, which is more connected to part seven, but we saw the uh, program of daycares that was created the ministries don't have uh, the obligation to include linguistic clauses. So unless it's part of new direct directions that will be given, uh, will this uh, have effects on our communities? So that's why we're insisting more and more our communities don't have a connection with Heritage Canada, with uh, education, culture, um, this comes from other big ministries that have larger budgets. We need to go get uh, their, uh, get them implied, uh, implicated. So this is our concern right now. But not what we weren't. But it's not what we were asking, which is just one respo uh, responsible agency. On the last point, 
when powers are transferred to the province, QCGN and other uh, actors in the English community, including our school boards are completely, uh, they completely agree. Thank you. Also, Lorraine O'Donnell wanted to add uh, to your uh, discussion. Yes, I just wanted to say an interesting development in uh, in Bill C-13 that we, we couldn't capture in the journal because it happened before this new development is Alain Roy of Library and Archives Canada is doing interesting work on what he calls vitality of memory. And he's absolutely geared it to the thinking at the federal policy level around supporting communities for their history and heritage work. And what I find interesting is that Bill C-13 actually now at several places, I'm looking at the bill right now, talks about communities, uniqueness, diversity, and historical and cultural contributions. So my hope is that this is paving the way for some support when the new roadmap of policy to support the revised Official Languages Act comes out for increased support for heritage and memory and archives organizations uh, that are based in official language minority communities and that do so much to support and promote vitality. I'll put a link in the chat to Alain's important new work. Thanks. Thank you, Loren. Uh, so it would be the time now to go with the questions from participants um, attending the webinar. So we have a first question I received. Uh, is there a true cooperation between the commissioner and the Quebec government? Uh, so I'll be taking answers from uh, uh, several uh, members of the panel. So who would like to answer that question first? Could you repeat the question, please? Yes, for sure. Is there true cooperation between the commissioner and the Quebec government? What I would say is that the um, um, we have we have interacted with the, the Quebec government in several times, uh, but I would not say that the commissioner's office has uh, uh, any kind of agreement with the Quebec government. That we intervene more in the community than we do with the government. Thank you, Mr. Teberge. If you have other questions, uh, those that participate, uh, don't be shy to ask them in our chat. So I'll ask another one that uh, came from those that are participating. Uh, all members of the panel can answer. We're in a particular situation in Canada where French speakers are a majority in Quebec and a minority in Canada, and where English speakers that are a majority in Canada are a minority in Quebec. So the challenges are not the same for the two languages. French uh, speakers uh, have uh, one challenge is the vitality of the language. The fact that the, the language can keep a place within Canada, whereas it's mostly defending the language that's uh, more the challenge of English speakers in Quebec to assure a vitality of communities, uh, English communities in Quebec where the language is not at risk. So we know the differences within the challenges of French speakers and English speakers, but what are the things in common? What are the common challenges uh, where they can come together and become a common objective uh, on the level of the country? So uh, when you're ready to answer the question. If I rephrase, it can be also with the question of what are the differences and resemblances in the challenges uh, around French and English uh, minority communities within Canada. It's uh, more natural maybe to think that the challenges are distinct than um, similar. Um, and we didn't see often in history but there's maybe some parts that I'm forgetting, but uh, maybe collaborations that were done between English and French um, between Can in Canada, but there were some cases where there's the collaboration that was done between QCGN, the SANB and the AFO in Ontario that wanted to develop uh, certain common positions on certain challenges, but now I forget which ones they were. 
maybe uh, in QCGN, they would be able to uh, rem uh, remind me about this, but um, there can be uh, certain challenges that we find in the general problems of official languages, but it's natural collaborations can maybe be done more easily be, uh, on the side of uh, French Quebec, or um, it's not naturally like this that we think uh, about challenges on the side of official languages. I would add maybe that it's something that is maybe less visible on the public level, but the dialogue exists. We regularly rub shoulders during conferences. Uh, the groups of, of the SCVN, uh, SCFA, QCGN, other members of our model uh, law um, will be beneficial to both communities. And so there are some challenges that are common that I think uh, maybe each on their own side with their own uh, nuances but there's probably more coordin um, informal coordination that's being done than what we can see or think uh, having said that one thing that's important and for scfa we see as being a gain is to recognize the how fragile french is everywhere in canada even in quebec right now the programs are not do not allow for example for a french spe speaker from quebec or from canada to uh, put in place initiatives to promote uh, French on the Canadian territory and uh, the French communities would benefit from uh, more support to promote French to make uh, known and understood the impact economically and uh, I think that this is a new avenue a new door that is being opened by Bill C-13 when we recognize there's something to be done with French and French is being uh, threatened but maybe we could uh, within the community promote the language uh, being uh, judges being bilingual is one thing services in French is another but I think the last few years we saw Quebec that's maybe less interested in what's going on in the institutions national federal institutions and for us as CFA it's important for the government of Quebec is interested in what's going on beyond its borders and that it will help us promote French so uh, as much uh, governmental as uh, on a civil level, I think that certain people think this is asymmetrical, but I think there's potential to uh, make French uh, shine a little bit everywhere. Thank you, Mr. Dutrie. There's also Lorraine O'Donnell that wanted to uh, add to this. We, uh, say, uh, sorry, yes, just to follow up on what I was mentioning about Alain Roy's work on vitality of memory, vitalité mémorielle, a new group of um, official language minority community groups whose role it is to support heritage, history, memory, and archives. So these are groups across the country is gathering and developing a new, what will be a new um, not-for-profit to look at official language minority community memory issues. So there's another point of contact. And there's actually quite a bit of um, shared issues or divergence, but also shared issues from the point of view of practitioners in that field. Thank you very much. So there's uh, a lot we could still continue talking about because uh, there's this uh, special issue you'll uh, be able to read on Irudzi, uh, where there's um, a lot to think about and there's a lot of research that can still be done. I, I would uh, let Eric Faub say the closing word so that he can conclude today's meeting, but conclude in the sense that today's discussion is over, but there's still a lot to be done, and we'll meet again in other events that will be uh, done by this institute. Thank you, Jason. I wanted simply to end by thanking, thanking everyone who is behind producing this uh, uh, number and this journal, because this is really um, mobilizes a lot of people together. A big thank you to Rial Alor, who retired from the journal at the end of 2021, and to Jason, 
who took over, but I would also like to add that Real is an honorary member and he'll counsel us. Stéphanie Chouinard, members of the uh, committee. There's a uh, new faces that will uh, come and that have already shown up. We think of all the evaluators, the uh, revisers, translators, I'd also like to thank the partners, uh, Heritage Canada, the CNFS, that also support this journal, and the Erudzi team that offers an essential service to this journal. So there we are. Thank you very much, Eric. So you have access to uh, our, our text that we show on social uh, media. So you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. This is all published as we go, and we're very open to your suggestions, so don't uh, hesitate to communicate with us. Thanks. I also wanted to thank the uh, funders who support Questgrin and all our work, notably the Secretariat aux Relations avec les Québécois d'expression anglaise that co-sponsored the conference leading to this publication, Canadian Heritage and Concordia University. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you all for uh, attending this webinar. It was um, a first uh, a first try for us, but I think we're going to continue doing this for all this, the uh, special issues of uh, the journal. So thank you very much. See you soon.